your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of St. Matthew. The Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 10 through 12. Matthew, chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. The, my message is entitled, Blessed are the Persecuted. Now, beloved, I'm preaching this message because the Lord wouldn't leave me alone and because we, the lateness of the hour in redemptive history, we need to be a people prepared for the coming of the Lord. Amen? And so I just as soon have this under your belt as we enter the Advent season because I don't know when the Lord's coming, but I do believe that it will be soon. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Blessed are the persecuted. This is Jesus' great Olivet, Olivet Discourse, His Sermon on the Mount. And he says, beginning with verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You live for the Lord you can expect persecution. Amen. Father in heaven, I pray that you'd anoint this preacher with feet of clay. Lord, give me the spiritual anointing that I'll need this morning and infuse strength into my flesh, Father. When I'm weak, I know that you tell me when I'll be strong. And Father, I pray you'd bless your word. You'd minister to your people. Lord, may we be a people prepared for the coming of the Lord. We ask it in Christ our Savior and hopefully our soon coming King's name. Amen. You may be seated. Beloved, I always stand amazed when I read Christ's Sermon on the Mount. You say, why is that, preacher? Because the moral and spiritual truth he teaches us here are so contrary to the world. They're so contrary to the unsaved uh, people and what they believe. Amen? I mean, just think about it, beloved. Did you ever really ponder what Christ taught here? Uh, Who would have ever thought that you're blessed when you're poor in spirit? Who would have ever thought you're blessed when you're meek or when you're mourning? Who'd have ever blessed, uh, uh, thought you'd be blessed when uh, you'd be merciful to someone, beloved, or a peacemaker? No, not me. How's about you? I, I would never think that. But, I'm, uh, but what really amazes me, beloved, in this Olivet, Olivet Discourse is the final beatitude that Christ states right here in verses 10 through 12. When he says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for uh, my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding, exceeding glad. He said, For so persecuted the prophets which were before you. So, beloved, can you believe it? Christ tells his disciples that they'll also be blessed when they're persecuted for following him and living right when they're persecuted for righteousness sake, when they're persecuted for following the Lord of glory. Beloved, now I don't know about you, but in my flesh, this seems like an awful way to win friends and influence people. How about you? I mean, beloved, if I was trying to get folks to follow me, I'd have never (laughs) said anything like this, lest they become so afraid, they become so discouraged that they never want to be one of my disciples. Now, I want you to imagine in your mind, let me illustrate what I'm saying. Suppose that you were to buy a new car. So you go down to the dealership down the street right here, and you see the latest model car, and you say to the salesman, I'd like to take this for a test drive. He says, sure, go right ahead. So he gets in the car with you, and then as you drive out of the parking lot, he launches into a negative sales spiel, a negative pitch about the car, and he says, I'll tell you what, I would never buy this car. I mean, this car, when you ride it in for three hours, your back will be so out of joint that you're going to need a back brace to walk upright again. Not only that, he says, I'll tell you another thing. If this car ever breaks down, it's going to cost you a four. I could put my kids through college what it's going to take you to repair it. And not only that, when you drive out of the parking lot, this car looks so different, so ugly, that people are going to uncontrollably laugh at you. You say, well, nobody would ever do that. Of course they wouldn't. They would never be able to sell a car. But listen to me now. This is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing here. Would you say amen? You listen to me, beloved. This is, in essence, exactly what Jesus uttered, this final beatitude about persecution. That's what he's saying. So he now showed them the inescapable danger, the downside of following him. And as I read this, this makes me think, what? was our Lord thinking at that time when he uttered these words. I mean this, beloved. If this is a sales pitch 
to be a Christian from a human standpoint, it just doesn't seem like it would be very effective, does it? Hey, you want to follow me? Yeah, I do, but ah, you can count on persecution. Hallelujah. You want to be blessed? I sure do. When you follow me, you'll be reviled. Praise the Lord. You want to follow me? I do, Lord. Well, you'll be mighty. Glory to God. Aren't you glad? That ought to win friends and influence people. You see, beloved, Jesus wasn't making a sales pitch here. What he was trying to do was offer comforting words to all of his disciples to prepare us for the persecution that's definitely going to come when we start really following him. Would you say amen? See, he knows that no normal person likes persecution. But it comes with the territory of being a Christian. If you are a Christian, a real, true, born-again Christian living for the Lord, you will be persecuted is what Jesus is saying. Now, folks, there's four things here that Jesus teaches us about persecution and about being blessed in persecution. The first thing I want you to see is the reassurance for the persecuted. Look what he says in verse 10a. Blessed are they which are persecuted. Let me stop you right there. Now, folks, our Lord knew that this was a very sober and somber message for his disciples to now hear, and that after they heard it, that they'd indeed be verbally and violently persecuted as his followers, they'd no doubt be disheartened. They'd be discouraged. It's great, Jesus. We've been following you, watching the miracles. This is unbelievable. Seeing the things that you've done, seeing you feed the 5,000, the 3,000. Actually, it was tens of thousands, really. But boy, this is unbelievable. But that was the upside of following Jesus, wasn't it? But Jesus is showing us here, beloved, there'll be a downside. And Jesus knew that we'd get discouraged, we'd get disheartened. So to comfort and encourage them to persevere and endure in the spiritual battle, he first prefaces his statements of woe with the word blessed, makareos, meaning that they're to be supremely happy, supremely fortunate, supremely to be envied by all when they're persecuted. Now that word persecuted, dioko, means when they suffer harassment and hostility for him when they suffer oppression and affliction for him, when they suffer trouble and torment and trials and tribulation for him. He says, blessed are you, be it either verbally or violent. When you suffer these things for me, you're going to be makarios. You're going to be blessed by me. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, why does Jesus do it? Because he's trying to assure us and reassure us, uh, both them and us, that we'll be blessed when we suffer emotionally for the Lord Jesus Christ, when we suffer spiritually or physically for the Lord Jesus Christ, and worse yet, when we suffer martyrdom for the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because 1 Peter 4.14 says, If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the Spirit of God and of glory now rests upon you. Wouldn't you say amen? When you're being persecuted, the Spirit of the living God comes down upon you, and the glory of God shines on you, in you, with you, through you. And so he says, blessed are you. Blessed are the persecuted. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, we're not to have a martyr's complex, okay? In the early church, a lot of people had a martyr's complex. In fact, when they took the Lord's table, and there was broken bread and poured out wine, they were saying, well, I want to be martyred, because they knew the glory that would come upon them. So we're not to have that. We're not to go around looking for trouble, all right? <laughs> but God is assuring us here that trouble will indeed find us. In Acts chapter 5, as you read it, the apostles, beloved, were arrested. They were in prison. They were beaten by the Sanhedrin for preaching Jesus and working miracles in his name. But God sent his angel, and he supernaturally sprung them from jail, and they went right back to the temple, and they kept on preaching. But consequently, beloved, they were then rearrested and beaten again and forbidden to ever speak about Jesus again. But then they were, real, they were released from the council. And Acts 5 4 says this that they left the presence of the council rejoicing, probably 14, I think it was, that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name, and so shouldn't we. To be counted worthy, not to suffer because I did something wrong, not to suffer because I'm politically correct. Well, not me, I'm incorrect, I'll tell you right now. 
but to suffer because I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You listen to me now. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, the Apostle Peter said, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. If your feet are being put in the fire right now, like mine are, because you're a Christian, because of where you stand, God says the Spirit of glory is upon you. God says the Holy Ghost has come upon you. God says you're now suffering for my sake. Blessed are the persecuted. Amen? You see, Jesus warned us. As you read the Gospels in John, uh, uh, John chapter 15, beloved, I don't have time to go there because i got so much ground to traverse. But Jesus warned that the world, if the world hates you, know that it first hated me. So you're in good company, aren't you? And he said that if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you, for the servant is not greater than his master. He's the master, we're the servant. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. Why in the world, why, we ask, why would the world so hate and persecute Christians? Now, beloved, think about it. We try to live holy, righteous, and godly lives. We try to be good friends. We try to be good neighbors. We try to help people, beloved. We try to do all these things that were, uh, would, would exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Even good citizens, can you imagine the best? That's one of the things that conquered the Roman Empire. The best citizens they had were not the pagans, they were the Christians. But why in the world, beloved, you imagine why, if you're doing all those righteous things, why would the world hate you? Why would they persecute you? Well, I'll tell you why. Because they utterly hate what and who it is that we represent, namely the Lord Jesus Christ. And that name shakes you to your core because you have to do something with Jesus. You just can't brush him off. You can't put him on a shelf. There's no neutrality. Jesus says you're either with me or against me. He was from Tennessee, I told you. Or against me. You can't straddle the fence with the Lord Jesus Christ. You're on one side or on the other. He said, who is on the Lord's side? Are you on the Lord's side? I hope you can say, praise the Lord, preacher. I am. I am on the Lord's side. And so, beloved, they utterly hate Jesus. And they utterly hate his person and his message. They utterly hate his gospel. They utterly hate his church and his people, beloved. Jesus said that as Christians, we are the moral and spiritual salt and light of the world. Jesus said that as Christians, beloved, we are the moral and spiritual conscience and compass of the world. We are the moral and spiritual and proverbial finger in the eye and thorn in the side of the world. What are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying this, that our life, our message, our testimony, beloved, convicts them. And we stand for everything they utterly hate. When you become a Christian, it's not business as usual anymore, is it? There's responsibilities now that are cast upon you because the reward is so unbelievably great, isn't it? So, beloved, they hate everything. And we stand for why. I'll tell you why. Because it exposes their moral and spiritual sins and sinfulness. Why, preacher? Because it exposes their ungodly and unrighteous deeds. Why, preacher? Because it exposes their evil. Their wickedness, beloved. The Bible says the whole world lieth in wickedness, in abysmal moral and spiritual darkness. Now, we know that Satan is indeed the god of this evil world system, and he rules over, the Bible says, the kingdom of darkness that tries to blind men's mind to the truth. Why? So they won't be saved. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to him that, them that are lost, whom the god of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them, and they get saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Excuse me. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. <laughs> I'm not doing very well this morning. Bear with me. Hence, beloved, beloved, as Christians, what I'm saying is we stand for what they utterly hate, what they utterly loathe. So we must understand that the kingdom of God is diametrically opposed to and it is organized radically different than the kingdoms that are set up in this world. Would you say amen? amen? Beloved, listen to me. In the kingdom of heaven, wealth and looks and power uh, in prestige, they're not important to God. 
You say, well, Pastor, what's important to God? I'll tell you what's important to God. Holiness is important to God. Righteousness is important to God. Godliness, justice, virtue, humility is important to God. Hey, how about morality? Think that's important to God? How about decency? Think that's important to God? I think so, beloved. How about fairness? You know, you can't read the Old Testament and God especially, beloved, dealing with the children of Israel, how they dealt with other nations. God says, you treat them as you would treat someone in your own nation. You treat that stranger well. Now, they have to comply with the rules of the nation, okay? Not what's going on today. But what I'm saying, that, beloved, God chastises his people because they're unfair to people like that. Oh, we can be so unfair to the hindmost of this world and the outcasts of this world because they haven't been blessed like us. But see, God loves fairness. And God loves the poor. He made enough of them. I'm saying, beloved, kingdom people have different priorities and values and beliefs than the unsaved folks of this evil world system. Would you say amen? amen. Beloved, I'm saying the kingdom people have uh, and seek different blessings, benefits, and bounties than the people of this uh, unsaved evil world system. I'm saying they have diverse attitudes and outlooks than the people of this evil world system. You see, beloved, the Bible teaches us that we are kingdom kids. Amen? And our moral and spiritual values and convictions, our moral and spiritual desires and philosophy, our moral and spiritual attitudes and actions ought to be a common copy of the Lord Jesus Christ and not of this evil world system. Would you say amen out there? This evil world system, the Bible says, is sinful. It is selfish. It is condemned. And God says, stay away from it or you'll be uh, condemned with it. You'll be condemned with the world. You see, beloved, this evil world system lusts after pride and prestige and they lust after power. And they lust after success and sex and money and wealth at any cost and woe unto them who stand in their way of ever attaining it. Oh, beloved, I've been there. I've had people, uh, I remember a very, very wealthy man and he said to me, well, coming to the church and being a member of the church. And I said to him, well, I says, we have criteria to join the church. And one of the things is you have to tithe like the rest of us. God commends us to tithe. Well, see, it's easy to give $10 if you're only making $100. But when you're making $10,000 or $20,000 a week, uh-oh, $2,000? That's right. That's God's, not mine. I don't touch this money. It's not mine. This is God's money. And you owe Him. And if you don't, He's going to take it out of your heart anyway. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you is this. I'm saying as kingdom kids, our whole philosophy... Our whole outlook in life is to reflect and replicate that of the Lord Jesus Christ and not that of the greedy and immoral stock market on Wall Street and not that of the greedy and immoral corporate America or business barons of this world. Certainly not of the TV shows or advertisements or what's presented on social media. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying it's because Christians are radically different this is what brings us into a head-on collision and confrontation with the people in this evil world system that lies in the lap of Satan's kingdom of darkness. This guy, when he saw he had a tithe, I said, look, you're not giving it to me. If he did it, you wouldn't see me. I sent you a card from Hawaii. It was beautiful. I said, you're giving it to the Lord, not me. You say, well, that's a lot of money. Depends on God owns all your money anyways. He gave you what you've got. You're just giving back a little bit to show you trust him. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, so Jesus tells us here that all his disciples will be persecuted, but he says, blessed are the persecuted. Amen. Why? Why does he say that? To encourage us. Why does he say that? Because he's trying to comfort us. Why does he say it, Pastor? Because he's trying to reassure us that God is for us no matter who or what is against us. Wouldn't you say amen? So that's point number one, beloved, the reassurance for the persecuted. Number two, I want you to see the reason for the persecution. Look what he says in verse 10a again. Blessed are they which are persecuted, and he says, for righteousness sake. sake. <clears throat> now here Jesus clarifies and he expresses the specific reason for our persecution. Notice what he uses. He uses the word dikesune, which is the Greek word righteousness sake. Blessed are they that are persecuted, he says, what? For dikesune, that is righteousness sake. That is anyone who lives a holy, righteous, and godly, virtuous, and upright life. Now listen to me now. 
that's in harmony with the moral and spiritual requirements of God's law as found in His word, will, and ways, then they are sure to be persecuted. Now you're living just like the Lord Jesus Christ. And hey, let me ask you something. Was He persecuted? You see, beloved, I'm saying why? Why ought I be persecuted? Because now you're living contrary and diametrically opposed to the norms of how the people of this world live. And the Bible says that Christians are an affront to them, even as kind as you can be and loving as you can be. I've used this illustration before, but I think it's apropos. And I'm not a big fan of Billy Graham, okay? But all that to say, when he was golfing one day with a bunch of senators, he never said a word. He was out there golfing. And one of the senators, when they finally got through uh, golfing, and they went to the clubhouse, and one senator said to the other senator, he said, well, how'd you like Billy Graham? He says, I hate him. He said, you hate him? He said, he didn't say a word. He said, yeah, but <laughs> just being in his presence. Because whether I like it or not, he lived what he taught, what he uh, walked the walk, I should say, not just talk the talk, amen? So he was convicted, beloved. You see, we're in the front of them. The Apostle Paul said this to young Pastor Timothy in three, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. He says, Yea, and all those who will go live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. In other words, there's no if, ands, or buts, or maybes about it, beloved. When you live a holy and an upright life for God and you're vocal about your faith by always sharing the gospel, then Satan will make sure, make sure that his demons and the people of this evil world system will definitely attack and afflict you. They will definitely, beloved, harass and oppress and trouble you. And they will definitely also kill and martyr you. And this has been proven again and again and again throughout church history. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, just like they did to Stephen, who was the first martyr of the church. Now, the word martyr in the scripture, matari, or martus, depending on the verb or the adjective. It means to witness through blood. To witness through your life blood for the Lord Jesus Christ. The glorified Christ says this in Revelation 2.10. He says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. But, beloved, those who don't live godly for the Lord Jesus Christ have no clue of what real persecution is like because they live and act and dress and talk so much like the world. <laughs> right? They have not a clue what I'm talking about here. You stand with the Lord Jesus. See what happens. Now, beloved, I want you to look at verse 10b. He says, For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, what a blessed promise to those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Amen. Notice it says, Theirs is Basilea Arunas. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, beloved, they are the chosen benefactors and inheritors of all of God's divine blessings, benefits, and bounties in the spiritual and in the king, eternal kingdom of God and sphere where God and the Holy Spirit and Christ the King now rules and reigns. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying in the kingdom of heaven, there's salvation. Hallelujah. In the kingdom of heaven, the Bible says there's immortality. You're going to have a glory new, brand new body. Would you say amen? They can transcend time and space like the Lord Jesus Christ. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned unto, like unto His glorious body, according to the work and whereby He's even able to subdue all things unto Himself. That's Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. See, that's what I'm looking for when Christ's coming back. Oh, Lord, today, today would be great. <laughs> oh, beloved, how blessed are the persecuted. Amen, says our Lord Jesus. So what does it mean to be persecuted for righteousness sake? Now, I want you to hear me, and I want you to pay close attention. Because I want you to learn this. It means that people will persecute you for loving and living and following after the Lord Jesus Christ. For living like the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, beloved, they'll persecute you for living a holy, righteous, and godly life that's in conformity to God's word, will, and ways, and that word is now the authority in your life, and you're submitting it to it. Amen? It means that God's people will now, uh, I mean, the people of this world will persecute you for pre the, preaching the gospel to citizens in the kingdom of darkness. You know, you go up to someone, and nobody likes confrontation, 
and no one likes conviction. But I, 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 I don't know how many, I've witnessed the countless thousands. But I, I've said to a person, he's been talking, he said, yeah, well, God willing. I said, you know God? What, what do you mean? I said, let me ask you a question. If you were to die right now and stand before God and he were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to him? Well, I'm a good person. I said, you better than Jesus? I said, let me ask you another question. If your son died for me and he, you punished him in my place, is there anything I could do with him better for you than what your son did for me? He said, well, no. I said, well, that's what Jesus did. Oh, but now they come under conviction. Blood. What are you, a holy roller? Yeah, what are you? Unholy? Ungodly? Unrighteous? What kind of roller are you? You're going to get rolled over because the Bible says that that stone will crush you to pieces if it falls on you. Amen? Now, I don't say it like I'm preaching to you. <laughs> I, I try to be loving. Calm down, Joel. Calm down. <laughs> But, beloved, it means that people will persecute you for defending and standing up for all of the moral and spiritual truths and principles and precepts as taught in the Holy Scriptures. So they'll persecute you for obeying the commandments of God and being a Christian and following after Jesus and being a son, a saint, a servant, a soldier, a seeker, a steward, and a sheep of God. <laughs> I pray that every day. <laughs> In 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, the Bible says this, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. It hated him before it hates you. So, beloved, the world hates and persecutes God's people. Paul said that we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Amen? Now, beloved, listen carefully. How can you tell if you're being persecuted for righteousness' sake? Now, Scripture is clear on this, beloved. Now, listen to me. If you stand up for Christ and preach out against sin and evil, then you'll be persecuted for righteousness. You'll be hated for it. If you stand up and preach out against moral and spiritual lies, beloved, and falsehoods and false religions, they will call you an intolerant, narrow-minded bigot, and you will be hated and persecuted for righteousness' sake. Well, what about the Buddhist? How's he going to get to heaven? Through Jesus, I tell him. And they say to me, what about the Hindu? I said, through Jesus. What if they didn't know about Jesus? That's why I'm telling you right now. That's why we're preaching the gospel. That's why God's got his church on the earth. Oh, beloved, listen to me now. If you stand up for Christ and preach out against iniquity and idolatry and immorality and injustice, then you'll be hated and persecuted for righteousness' sake. If you stand up for Christ and preach out against cussing and cursing and blaspheme in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will definitely be hated and persecuted for righteousness' sake. If you stand up for Christ and preach out against drugs and drunkenness, beloved, then you'll be persecuted for righteousness' sake. Hey, listen to me now, I'm not done yet. If you stand up for Christ and preach out against premarital sex and fornication and adultery, like we do, like your preacher does, and I hope you do, then you will be hated and persecuted for righteousness' sake. Oh, beloved, listen to me now. If you stand up for Christ and preach out against homosexuality and lesbianism and transgenderism, beloved, then you will be uh, persecuted for righteousness sake. I can't tell you, beloved, listen to me now. We want to get these people saved. We love them. They're made in the image of God, but we've got to tell them the truth. You can't lie to them. We've got to tell them the truth. If they're ever going to grace the doors or darken the doors of God's heaven. Amen. Beloved, if you stand up for Christ and preach out against living with some shacking up, or gay marriage, or abortion, and a host of other ungodly and unholy and unrighteous worldly practices, then you can bet your bippy you will be hated and persecuted for righteousness' sake. sake. Amen? Now, beloved, Jesus warned the apostles that the world would hate and persecute and kill those who followed him. And I can tell you, church history proves this to be true, for most of them anyways. Listen to me. The Apostle James was run through with a sword by King Herod. You can see that in Acts 12, by the way, but I'm just going to move along. The Apostle Peter was crucified upside down. He says, I'm not worthy to die like my Lord died. And he watched his wife first crucified, and he fell on his face, and he begged her, don't renounce Christ, don't renounce Christ. And when she died, he said, crucify me upside down. I'm not worthy to die like my Lord. And they did. They crucified Peter upside down. The apostle Andrew was crucified on an olive tree. 
The apostle Thomas was run through with pine spears and tormented with red-hot iron plates and then burned alive at the stake. The apostle Philip was tortured and then crucified. Matthew was beheaded. Matthias was stoned while he hung on the cross. Nathaniel was skinned alive and then crucified. The apostle James the last was thrown from the temple mount, but he didn't die anymore, and they started beating him to death with clubs. And beloved, the apostle Simon the Zealot was crucified. Thaddeus was beaten to death with sticks. The Bible says that St. John the Beloved was boiled in oil, but he didn't die. So what did they do? They took this old man in his 90s and they ex- uh, exiled him to the prison isle of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. And then, beloved, we know the Apostle Paul was beheaded in Rome. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying this, that countless, countless millions of other Christians down through the centuries have been hated and persecuted and martyred for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, read a cursive review of church history. In the early church, they were fed to lions and tigers, fed to beasts like that. They were hung by the neck. They were burned at the stake. They were drowned and and stoned, beloved, and starved to death. They were hacked to pieces. They were tortured. They were pulled apart on racks. Imagine, the Roman Catholic Church put them on racks and had horses pull them and that rope until they pulled their arms and legs out of joint and killed these Christians. You see, beloved, they were shot and they rotted to death in prison. You say, Pastor... How were they ever able to remain faithful and endure such horrible persecutions? Good question. I'm glad you asked me that. For $2.50, I'll tell you the answer later. I'll tell you how, beloved. Read Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. 12, 11. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. It triumphantly proclaims that they overcame Satan in their persecutions by the blood of the Lamb, and they loved not their lives unto the death. In fact, beloved, they knew this, that in Revelation 12, 10, it says, if you're faithful unto death, I will give you a crown of life. Wouldn't you say amen out there? Oh, beloved, that's a modest crown. Oh, beloved, that's eternal life. That's the crown of eternal life. Wouldn't you say amen out there? Beloved, I'm saying these people of God were so filled with God's spirit and grace that they were able to endure whatever was put before them. You can't do it on your own. I don't have the strength to do it. Neither do you, but I'll tell you this, if God's hand's upon you, you can do it. Amen? All things are possible for him that believeth, the Bible says. During the Dark Ages, beloved, for a period of about 1,200 years, historians tell us that the papacy, now listen, murdered and martyred anywhere from 50 to 200 million born-occurring Christians who would not bow their knee to the heresies of the apostate Roman Catholic Church. They said that you have drifted so far from what the scriptures teach, we've got to get away from you. So Rome tried to force them to bend their knee to them, to come under the rubric of their control by persecuting them. Modern statisticians tell us that 1900, in the, since 1900, excuse me, over 26 million Christians have been persecuted and martyred. Now, beloved, that's 4.5 thousand Christians a day. That's 334 Christians a month. That's 77 Christians a week, and that is 11 Christians a day. Even as I'm standing here right now, Christians are being put to death all over this world. That's amazing, isn't it? You see, beloved, Christians are the most persecuted people on the top side of this earth. But Oh, Jesus says, blessed, blessed are the persecuted. Would you say amen out there? During the 20th century, Communist China killed over 5 million Christians and persecuted and incarcerated hundreds of thousands more today. Just look at your news, beloved. Iran, Saudi Arabia, many other Arab nations and terrorist groups like the Taliban, like Hamas, like Hezbollah have persecuted and mounted countless thousands more. Think nothing of it. Cut off their heads, rape their children. Uh, beloved, it's just so disgusting. I, in my flesh, I like to say, Lord, let me join the Marine Corps again. Give me my M60 machine gun back again and turn me loose. I nothing to lose at this age right now. You shoot me, I go to glory. Amen? Amen? Amen. I better wash out. <laughs> you don't know this is bulletproof down here. <laughs> you see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this here. First Peter 4.12 warns. It says this, it says, Beloved, 
Think it not strange, the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. It's not strange to me, beloved. I've been a Christian long enough to see it. It comes and goes, ebbs and flows. But a lot of people think it's strange. Why, I'm just trying to be a good person. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> I'm just trying to live with Jesus. That's the problem. You're a thorn in their flesh. You're a finger that's poking them in the eye. And you're bringing them under conviction. So I ask you this morning, beloved, are you being persecuted for righteousness? Like you say, well, yeah, preacher. Then remember, Jesus said, blessed are the persecuted. I ask you, beloved, are you being prepared to be persecuted for righteousness' sake? You say, well, I hope so. Then remember, God said, blessed are the persecuted. Are you willing to be persecuted for righteousness' sake? Oh, I hope so, preacher. Then remember, God said, blessed, blessed. Makarios, <clears throat> blessed are the persecuted. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, we need to pray. We need to pray for courage and strength to endure the persecution, beloved. Not only what's going on right now, but I've been teaching you that which is yet to come. There's a great fight ahead of us. This age is going out with a bang. And your enemies are going to be those members of your own family. And that person may be sitting next to you. Jesus says they'll think you're doing God a service when they turn you over. You're crazy. You belong to that church or that born-again church over there. You're crazy. That's right. We're crazy for Jesus. You're nuts. Yeah, but I'm screwed onto the right bolt. How about you? So, beloved, what have I taught you so far? The reassurance for the persecuted. The reason for the persecution. Number three, the reproach of the persecuted. I want you to look in verse 11. He says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now, beloved, the word revile or revile you on a dizo autos here means to be personally reproached and reviled on for Christ's sake. It means to be personally slandered and maligned for Christ's sake. It means to be criticized or even vilified for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus wants us to know here that following here, him comes with a high cost, doesn't it? It isn't just like you following Buddha and just nobody gets mad at that. So you can go meditate all you want. You're not hurting anybody. You're not killing bugs even, you know, because they might be, Buddha might be in that bug. <laughs> but Jesus wants us to know that it's a high cost to follow him. So we must be prepare, prepare ourselves for the hate and the persecution that lies ahead of us. You know, people will... Verbally cast insults at you for being a Christian. And beloved, you know it. They mock you. They scorn you. I mean, they do all kinds. They ridicule and laugh at you for following the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do they do it? Because they're trying to scare you and shame you into renouncing and rejecting your faith. But don't you do it. There's much too much at stake. Eternity is at stake. Heavens is at stake. And hell is real. Or Jesus would have never died on the cross. Would you say amen? In Mark 8, 38, the Lord Jesus Christ warned. He said, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. If you're ashamed of Jesus, he says, I'll be ashamed of you. Oh, hear me now. If you love the things that Jesus loves and you hate the things that Jesus hates, then you'll surely be hated and persecuted for righteousness sake. And notice, beloved, people will also, it says, say all manner of evil, ipon pasponeros. That is, they'll now verbally and cruelly slander and impugn your character and reputation with every wicked and defaming insult and slur they can come up with, beloved. Why do they do it? Because they're trying to disparage you. They're trying to defame you. They want to mock you, beloved. Why? They want to discredit your witness. They want people to follow them. This happens in churches, by the way. You Christians who are living for the Lord, those who aren't, and they'll, the ones who aren't say, you Pharisee, what are you, a holy brother? Yeah, you wish you were too, right? But that, their life is bringing you in conviction. That's why you're saying that. You say, preacher, I'm going to kill you. You have to wait in line to kill me. I could line them up. I want you to look at verse 11b. He says, they'll say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. 
Now notice they do this pseudomai. That is falsely. That is they deliberately and dishonestly speak lies and untruths and falsehoods about you. That is, beloved, they knowingly and purposely and consciously and calculatedly turn around and speak these untruths and lies and falsehoods about you. Why do they do it? They want to dishonor your character. Why do they do it, preacher? To ruin your reputation. Why do they do it, pastor? Because they want to discredit your faith and testimony so people won't listen to your gospel witness and be converted to Christ. Yet Jesus said this in John 16, verses 2 and 3. He says, and these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor have they known me. People who don't know God. Don't know God. Before I got saved, I was a semi-religious Roman Catholic. It wasn't a day of my life I can't remember I didn't pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When I got saved, I was stunned. Nobody had to convince me of the Trinity, that Jesus was, But I wasn't saved. I had that information from here up, right? But the Catholic Church never taught me that I needed to be born again. They said when I was an infant and baptized, I was born again. That's a lie. It comes right out of the pit of hell and even smells like smoke. That wasn't true. The Bible nowhere ever teaches that. Hey, beloved, you listen to me, brother. Listen to me. You're in good company when they stop persecuting you. Why? They did it and they ridiculed the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saying they mocked and ridiculed the apostles. Beloved, right from the outset of the church age, we see that they have persecuted the church and Christians for millenniums down through the years, for over 2,000 years. Would you say amen out there? So Jesus said, blessed are you when you're hated and persecuted. Blessed are you when they slander and mock and ridicule you. Blessed are you when they criticize and they lie about you. Sure, it hurts you. Sure, it offends you, beloved. Sure, it upsets you. And remember, you're being blessed by God when they do it because it shows now that you truly belong to Christ and you've now entered into His suffering for you, so you need to offer up your suffering to Him. Would you say amen? Blessed are the persecuted. i got seven minutes left, and I'm going to give you point number four. The reaction of the persecuted. Look what he says. In verse 12, now we've seen the reassurance for the persecuted, the reason for persecution, the reproach of the persecuted. Now look at the reaction of the persecuted. Verse 12, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted the prophets which were before you. Oh, what an encouraging statement our Lord gives us here about how to react and how to respond when hate and persecution erupts in your life. Jesus says that we're to rejoice. Hiro is that word. It means that we're to be happy, cheerful, joyful, and also be exceeding glad. Agaliao. That means we're to literally jump up and down with joy and exultation. Woo! Glory to God! I'm being persecuted. Hallelujah! Jesus said, I don't want you to fear, and I don't want you to fret, and I don't want you to complain. I don't want you to be troubled. I don't want you to be upset. Why? Because I'm going to give you two reasons why you need to be blessed when you're persecuted. Number one, because of the promised reward. Look what he says in verse 12b. He says, for great is your reward in heaven. Beloved, Jesus promises us who are hated and persecuted for righteousness sake and his sake. He says, great, palus, that is large, huge, enormous is your reward, mythos. That is your divine repayment from God in heaven, your divine remuneration from God in heaven, your divine compensation from God who is in heaven. And remember, beloved, the apostles said that they counted themselves worthy to suffer the shame for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we should also, amen. You see, God's saying he lays up eternal rewards, mega rewards, great rewards for those who patiently suffer for him. Paul said to the church in 1 Thessalonians 3.3, he says that no man should be moved by the afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed unto these. You say, Pastor, are you saying I've been appointed to be persecuted? Yes, you have. So haven't I. Because you're God's people. And you live in the kingdom of light. So our attitude and our reaction must not be one of fear or anger or pride, beloved, or one of retaliation. We shouldn't have some moral or spiritual superiority 
But when we are hated and persecuted, it must be one of love and one of resolve and one of faithfulness and one of honor that we've been counted worthy to suffer for Christ's sake. Blessed are the persecuted. So how we react, beloved, when we're hated and persecuted and reviled and falsely accused determines our eternal rewards in heaven. So that was the first reason why, beloved, because of the promised reward. Secondly, because of the past reminder. He said, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now, Stephen was the first martyr of the church, beloved, and when he was martyred and persecuted, in Acts 5-2, Stephen confronts his, his persecutors, and he says this. He says, which, the Greek literally says, name one of the prophets that you haven't persecuted. Everybody I send to you who persecute. You don't want to hear what they have to say. You don't want to listen to the message that I've given to them to speak. Everyone, you complain, you mock, you persecute, you cut them in half, you burn them at the stake, you saw them, uh, saw their heads off and their arms off. So Stephen says, name one of the prophets that you haven't killed. And you know what? They couldn't. You see, afterwards they said, oh yeah, looking back in hindsight with 2020 vision. Yeah, they were really God's man. I see it now. But see, beloved, when you have a prophet in front of you, you're thinking that he's going to be someone who's absolutely perfect. Moses wasn't perfect. Aaron wasn't perfect. Paul wasn't perfect. Peter wasn't perfect. The only one that was perfect was Jesus. But that doesn't mean God doesn't work through men, does it? You have to wait till you're perfect, and God will never use you. All of the Old Testament prophets, beloved, and many of the New Testament prophets were persecuted and ultimately killed. Why? Because the ungodly testimony, or the godly testimony, I should say, of both their life and their lips so convicted people of their moral and spiritual sins and so enraged them that they persecuted and martyred them to try to silence the voice of conscience, silence their voice, shut them up, so they could appease their conscience and continue to comfortably live in their sin. You don't want some preacher around preaching out like I'm doing right now to do that. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 10 through 11, I'm not going to read it to you, beloved, uh, or, or quote the whole thing to you, but I just want to give you a, a brief synopsis. Under the fifth seal, when it was opened, we see the souls of them that were martyred under the altar. That is the souls of the martyred throughout the church age, and they were crying out to God saying this, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Beloved, these martyrs weren't crying out for God's divine vengeance against their enemies. They were crying out for divine justice against them. Why? Because, beloved, they wanted the persecutors to get their just due, their just rewards for now murdering them. But God gave them the white robes of righteousness and victory, and he told them this, quote, he says, rest a little season to the, their fellow servants and brethren, that is throughout the church age, should be killed and fulfilled, unquote. You see, beloved, when he said that, this anticipates and it reveals that many more born-again Christians will be martyred before Jesus returns. Indeed, Revelation 13, 15 through 17 also reveals that in the last days, just before the coming of the second advent, when Christ returns, that God's people who refuse to take the mark of the beast will be killed. The Bible says they'll have their heads cut off. And by the way, go home today and look up guillotines and see how many Americans bought. They got a whole storehouse full of them. I ask them why. They won't tell us why. I'll tell you why. Because they're going to fulfill prophecy. Am I telling you the truth, you people, folks who know that? Does it say that in Revelation chapter 13? They're going to lop their heads off, beheaded. And, and by the way, the guillotine was, was invented by a dentist because it was supposedly... So you had your head chopped off, it wasn't as painful as being burned at the stake or whatever. So, you know, you'd rather be burned at the stake than your head chopped. You'd rather have a hot steak than a cold chop, right? <laughs> you see, beloved, I'm saying to you that when we are persecuted, we need to constantly and continuously pray and say, Lord, give me strength, give me courage, give me holy boldness to play the man to be able to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, because I can't do it in my flesh. I don't have enough courage. I don't have enough strength. But, oh, God, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, the Lord Jesus said, Christ said this. 
He said that he that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. He says, in your patience, in Luke 21, 9, possess ye your souls. Now that's pretty important, isn't it? Because we look down the corridors of time now, and we see that the end is just about here, isn't it? Now I don't know how long the end may be. I'm not a prophet. I don't claim to be that. But boy, I'll tell you, prophets will be fulfilling right before our very eyes. So till the end comes, beloved, we must remain both faithful to God and keep on preaching the gospel so folks can flee from the wrath to come and be saved. Amen? Hey, I want my family saved. I want my friends saved. I want my co-workers saved. I want them saved. I'll do anything I can. Get them saved. I mean, I've had people ask me to do crazy things. He said, if you do that, I'll let you speak to me. I said, you will? Fee fi fo fum. I feel the blood of an Englishman. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've almost killed myself doing it sometimes, but I was able to give him the gospel. Well, let me close with this. In Acts 14 22, the Apostle Paul made this statement. He said, Through much tribulation we shall enter into the kingdom of God. He didn't say through some tribulation, he didn't say through a little tribulation. He said what? Through much tribulation. In the second century, many Christians were already being persecuted and martyred. This moved the church father, quote unquote, we call Tertullian, to make a profound and iconic statement. He said this. He said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And when they kill one of us, ten more pop up. And beloved, if you've ever read the Anti-Nicene Fathers, indeed they did. So much so that by the 4th century, the pagan Roman Empire had been conquered and turned professedly Christian. Oh, blessed are the persecuted, amen. In John 16, 3, Jesus said, And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. So there's a great fight ahead of us that's a coming. And we're to be more than conquerors in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said God always causes us to triumph in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Isaiah 54, 17, that no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, but every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness of me, saith the Lord. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of his cross and resurrection, has already defeated Satan, beloved, and he's won the war. Colossians 2.15 says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That is, in the cross. So now we just have to fight and win the spiritual battle set before us, but we fight in victories. Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, Paul says, when he thought about it, he just goes through saying, we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. They're going to persecute us. But then he said this. Listen, you can just see Paul the aged, like me. I was older. I'm older than Paul was. But he says this. I am persuaded. He's what? That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Come on and say amen out there. Nothing. I've used this illustration before, but I, I, I had written it down years ago and I had to find where I had it. So I'm going to kind of go back and forth here. But beloved, I remember reading the story of what historians call the blessed death and martyrdom of Polycarp. Now Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John and he was the pastor of the church at Smyrna in Asia Minor. So he personally knew the man who knew the man. But he was an old man now, and he was in his 90s. In 155 A.D., Polycarp had a vivid dream, and he saw that his pillow was on fire. When he awoke, beloved, he knew exactly what it meant. He knew that God was showing him that he had a die a martyr's death, so he told his followers, this is how I'm going to die. I will be burned at the stake. Soon, both the Jews and the Romans sought to persecute and kill him. So he did what Jesus told him to do. He fled from city to city, beloved, exactly doing what Jesus said in the scripture, but the Romans hotly and doggedly pursued him. When Polycarp saw that he could not escape them, he now ultimately sought refuge in a friend's home, and he patiently waited for the Romans to arrive. 
He knew that the dream God showed him in the time of his martyrdom had finally come, so he said this. He says, God's will be done to this old man. And that's what I pray now. When the Roman soldiers finally caught up with him to arrest him, he very cordially vet, met them at the door, and he invited them into his friend's home. And he said to them when they said, Are you Pastor Polycarp? He says, Yes, I am. He admitted it. And then he invited them in, beloved, and he said, Listen, I want you to give these Romans, these soldiers, something to eat and something to drink, for they're weary because of their journey. Consequently, when the Roman soldiers saw the deep humility and the kindness of Polycarp, they developed a great respect and fondness for this old man, this old saint. Now feeling terrible about what they've been ordered to do, beloved, they didn't want to kill him. But although they were smitten in their conscience, the writer said they had to obey their orders. But while they ate, Polycarp asked the captain if he could have some time to pray, and the, cramp, the captain granted him his request. For the next two hours, Polycarp, this old man, this old saint, so full of God's grace and spirit, went into the next room and began to fervently pray out loud. The Roman soldiers listened intently as he prayed for them and even fought back tears upon hearing it. Can you see him? Oh, Lord, bless these people who are trying to kill me. <laughs> May they get heartburn. <laughs> no, I'm <wondering. laughs> But can you imagine being there and he's praying for his own persecutors? These people who are going to burn him or these people who are going to nail him or whatever they're going to do to him. But he knew he was going to be uh, burned at the stake. So, beloved, when he finished, the Roman soldiers then very respectfully began to escort him back to the proconsul of Smyrna for trial. Along the route, Christians started lining the roads along in every city, and they came out weeping to meet and greet this godly pastor and encourage him in his ordeal. When he finally entered the arena in Smyrna and stood before the proconsul of, of Smyrna, it was the time of the year when they held their annual public games. When he entered that stadium, suddenly everyone heard a loud voice from heaven say, Polycarp, Polycarp, be strong, play the man. Well, beloved, upon hearing this, the crowd was shocked. And then they got angry, beloved, and seeing Polycarp, the crowd began, to, uh, uh, began with an uproar. And they, said, sh they shouted, kill him, we demand that you kill him, execute him. Our gods are better than his gods. But they heard the voice of God. I'm, I'm quoting to you from what one of his own followers wrote, his testimony. As Polycarp stood before the proconsul of Smyrna, the crowd became definitely silent to hear what was said by them. When the proconsul asked him if he was Polycarp, he said yes. Upon hearing this and seeing that he was a frail old man, the proconsul of Smyrna now pitied him and wanted to spare his life. So he tried to persuade Polycarp to renounce Jesus and apostatize from the faith. The pagans at this time used to call Christians atheists because they refused to worship their pagan gods. The proconsul pleaded with Polycarp to repent and worship the gods of Rome and then say, down with the atheists, meaning the Christians. So Polycarp obliged them. Polycarp. Then, beloved, looked around, looked at the crowd, very courageously gestured with his hand to the jeering mob. He said, down with the Christians, meaning the Romans. <laughs> this guy got some chutzpah, doesn't he? The proconsul of Smyrna then begged him, just take a pinch of insects and say, Kaiser Kurios, that is Caesar is Lord, and I'll let you go free. But instead, Polycarp took a pinch of insects and he loudly shouted, Christos Kurios, Christos Kurios, Christ is Lord, and there is none other. And that was a 90-something-year-old man. Christ is Lord, and there is none other. Now infuriated, the proconsul of Smyrna demanded that he swear allegiance to Caesar and the gods of Rome or he feed him to the wild lions and animals and beasts. Polycarp then calmly and confidently said this, I can just hear this old man. Eighty and six years, I have faithfully served the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's done me no harm. So how can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Then the proconsul threatened to burn him at the stake alive. Polycarp said this. He says, you threaten me with man's fire that burns but an hour and then goes out. 
but you know nothing of the fire of Christ's coming judgment and eternal punishment in hell when the fire never goes out. Therefore, I'd rather burn in your fire than Christ's fire. So what are you waiting for? Do what you must. As the Romans stacked the wood, the firewood, Polycarp, calmly undressed. He went down to his undergarments. And when they wanted to nail him to the stake to prevent his escape, he said, leave me as I am. For he that gives me the strength to endure the fire will enable me to stand with courage and not run away. So as they bound him with ropes, beloved, he loudly prayed. These are his words. Listen, quote, O Almighty God, now imagine you're in a stadium and everybody's listening. O Almighty God, the Father of our blessed and beloved Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the knowledge of you, to whom you are the God of angels and powers and every creature and all the righteous who live before thee, I give you thanks that you count me worthy to be numbered among the martyrs who share the cup of Christ's suffering and the resurrection unto eternal life in body and soul. Father, may I be received this day as an acceptable sacrifice as you have predestined and revealed to me in that dream, and is now being fulfilled. And then he closed by saying, I praise thee, I bless thee, I glorify you, along with the everlasting Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved and only begotten Son, to you with him, through the Holy Ghost, be glory both now and forever. Amen. Then the fire was lit, beloved, and the flame hotly blazed, And then everyone saw a miracle occur. People said they saw Polycarp standing there, but he was enshrouded in an arch. And it wasn't touching his, he just stood there with his hands behind him like this tied. And it wasn't touching his flesh. And they said as they kept watching him, he wouldn't burn. The wood's burning and the fire was just going around that arch. And they said he looked like a golden loaf of bread that was being baked. And then his followers said the whole stadium all of a sudden began to be filled with the smell of spices and frankincense. It filled the stadium. And they watched Polycarp, and he wouldn't burn. He wouldn't die. So the people stood up. They were angry. They shouted, kill him, kill him. And the fire burned out. Then a Roman soldier took out his dagger and went over. He went, and he stuck it in Polycarp's chest. And when he did, a dove flew out. And then they took his body. And they burned it. His followers picked up his ashes, and then they made a little urn, and they buried him, and only they know where they buried him right now. Jesus said in John 16, 33, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Blessed, blessed, I said blessed are the persecuted. Would you say amen? Let's go.